Very good. Um, thank you for this warm welcome. My name is Amelia and this is Anders. We work with Datahood.net, a Swedish NGO that focuses on policy advocacy in the field of data protection. We also do technical development to make sure that it's simple, easy and fast for people to fulfill their data protection obligations as we have enshrined in human rights conventions and the law. So I will start with some uh, paradigms of privacy to give an ideological context to what it is that we're doing. The concept of a right to privacy emerged in the 1870s as the right to be secret and the right to be left alone. Basically, it's a choice of whether you reveal data to the outside world, and if you do, you lose control, um, it's out of your hands, but you should also have the right not to reveal things. Now, most of the legislation we have in place in Europe today is rather based on a 1970s paradigm, uh, which is the right to privacy as control. Um, this means that even if you give away data to somebody else and you put it in somebody else's hands, like the government or a company, you still have some basic tools for protection, like you should know who collects your data, they should be accountable for collecting the data, you should have insight in how other people are trying to use information about you to exert control or influence the way that you behave. The most recent development, however, is fairly new, the past 20 years, and it's the right of privacy as a right to identi identity. Namely, it's not just a way of controlling who you are today or holding somebody accountable for what they're doing right now. It's also a way of ensuring your own identity formation in the future, a right to exercise some amount of influence over who you become. And so, uh, luckily, we have a new data protection regulation in Europe. It was finalized in December of 2015. It will enter into effect in May in 2018. And uh, even though it's mostly still based on this 1970s paradigm of transparency and accountability and control and information to uh, visitors of, of websites or users of IT systems, it also incorporates some of this thinking on the right to privacy as an identity, that you have the right to object to profiling measures or when people are trying to find out how to most conveniently send you advertisements or political informations to uh, influence on how you're voting or uh, what products that you're purchasing. So we went here last year and we talked about some of the preliminary research that we did in the field of data protection in Sweden and we found these dismal numbers. So for instance, we have only two out of 290 municipalities that don't help advertisers more efficiently track user visitors. We also talked last year about the five principles of data protection that were under negotiation by the European Parliament and the other EU institutions at the time. And these would be things like the right to know, the right to consent, uh, user-centric design and data protection by design, or um, uh, data minimization, which is uh, mostly what we will be talking about today, actually, uh, as well as effective sanctions against people who aren't, or companies that, public authorities as well, that aren't willing to uphold these principles for the users. So uh, we got funded last autumn to do these tools that help people more easily conceptualize uh, what they're doing wrong now and what they could be doing right in the future. Uh, we've made webcall.datakud.net, it's available in Swedish but also in English where you can test your own website uh, or the website of somebody else. And you can also get simple technical tips on, on how you can vastly improve data protection qualities of the website uh, simply and cheaply if you want to ask a webmaster to implement these measures. The code is available open source at the um, mentioned GitHub address, so if you want to make your own web privacy check tool, that is also going to be possible. This was made with money from the Internet Fonden, a Swedish foundation which um, sponsors technological projects that improve the internet. And perhaps the main part of our project was to make this mapping of Swedish municipalities. So unfortunately, it's only in Swedish, but as you can see, we've checked all of the municipalities in Sweden and we've graded them from A to E, with A being the highest grade. Um, nobody obtained the grade of A or B, and 207 out of 290 municipalities are in the E grade, so there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, the only th encouraging news that we have about that is, uh, fortunately, it's not going to take a lot of resources for the Swedish public sector to improve the quality of their websites. Um, the things that we checked for were stuff like uh, data leakage to internet service providers, schools, the work environment. Basically, when a website is leaking information to uh, somebody who's involved in the infrastructural level of communication, and also how you can, uh, what you can do to remedy that. But I will leave over some of the technical discussions to Anders, who will present the <coughs> challenges faced by websites and also how you can solve them very easily. So last year we talked about how 
HTTPS is important not just for what you traditionally think of as sensitive user data, uh, but that is also important for, well, the mere fact that you're visiting a certain page can in itself be sensitive. And while that's still true, we think you ought to uh, stop thinking about this, like, what's sensitive or not, because um, the fact is that this is a very subje subjective thing. What's sensitive to one person in one context can be harmless in another context. Some things can matter life and death for one person in one country. Uh, some else is, no. Uh, so, to borrow the stance of uh, the US government's CIO council, who published a great uh, uh, website uh, called the HTTPS Only Standard, all browsing activity should be considered private and sensitive. If you always use encryption, you don't have to make the judgment call about what's sensitive or not. Um, so HTTPS has three main features. One, it gives you reasonable certainty that the website you're communicating with is the one you intend to commun communicate with. It encrypts the traffic, of course. And it makes sure that no one can manipulate the traffic on the way from the server to your browser. This third point is important. Uh, there was a great talk by Nicholas Weaver, who is a security researcher at Berkeley, um, at, at, at the USENIX conference earlier this year, we talked about uh, how mass surveillance systems work, how cheap and easy it is to build your own, uh, why the NSA loves ad networks. And he concluded that uh, unencrypted traffic is not just an information leak anymore, it should be considered a vulnerability. If you don't use encryption, you have no idea if someone tampered with the data on the way from the server to the browser. Uh, Although sometimes you do know, I sometimes fly with Norwegian and uh, with their onboard Wi-Fi, they, like so many others, do a simple man-in-the-mill attack to inject their own CSS and JS on any unencrypted website that you visit to get their own toolbar. Uh, while this might seem harmless, it could just as well have been some douchebag trying to steal credit card details, rewriting login forms, re rewriting links serving malware. It could be a ISP or government agency targeting just one specific user, serving modified content to that user only. Um, last year, you might have heard GitHub uh, had a really bad attack, attacked by China, actually. Um, what happened was that, uh, so Baidu is like the Google of China, and like Google, they have an analytics service. And uh, at this time, one to two percent of all visitors from outside China who visit the website that used Byte Analytics would have the, would have the Byte Analytics JavaScript modified to include some code that would, in the background, reload two pages on GitHub, two specific pages, over and over. So millions of people unwittingly became part of a giant DDoS network. Um, Point being, if you don't use encryption, your website can be used as a weapon against other websites or other users. Also, if, even if you don't care about privacy or security, the fact is that the web is moving towards HTTPS only. Uh, for example, HTTP2 brings lots of speed performance benefits, and while the specification doesn't mandate the use of encryption, uh, the major browsers would only support HTTP2 over HTTPS. So in practice, you, you do have to use encryption to get the benefits of HTTP2. Also, both Chrome and uh, the Chrome team and Mozilla has announced their intent to phase out insecure HTTP. Uh, for example, they, they will uh, make certain powerful browser features impossible to use on, on encrypted websites. Very recently, it became impossible to use geolocation in Chrome on insecure websites. And if you don't have a certificate already, letsencrypt.org is the place to go. It's free, easy, automated, and it works very well. So another positive thing is that the WordPress community uh, and WordPress.com now provides uh, uh, HTTPS and encryption for all of the users of that site. So that's going to make it a lot easier for a lot of the people who are doing casual websites online to protect their visitors and themselves 
from this type of um, attack that we've seen. Now, the second criteria that we looked for was leaks of data to adjacent websites. And this is an old problem where if you go from one website to the other, um, basically the previous website that you were at, or the website where you go next, receives information about what you used to look at in the past. And this provides some um, really sneaky ways of monitoring the reading behavior of users and seeing in which order they're reading what information, thereby providing um, valuable information uh, maybe for the individual about how, how their private life is developing or how they're building their opinions. But I will again leave over to Anders to talk about the technical details of such data leaks and also, of course, what you can do to stop it from happening at your site. Right. So whenever you click a link, like if you're on food.com and you click a link to the Facebook page, your browser will normally tell Facebook exactly where you came from. Same thing if a page requests external stuff like CSS or JS, the so-called HTTP referrer header is always sent. Well, not always, but usually. Um, and I thought this was maybe because the people who designed this back in the 90s were naive about the privacy implications, but then I read the RFC that specified HTTP 1.0 uh, 20 years ago that actually had a note. Because the source of a link may be private information or may reveal an otherwise private information source, it is strongly recommended that the user be able to select whether or not the referral field is sent. Uh, this was 20 years ago, and well, this didn't happen. Moreover, most people have no idea this, what the referral header is or it is sent. Now, 20 years later, we do have the ability to help our visitors not leak data with refer policy. I mentioned this last year too, but it's very few people still know about it, so I think it's worth repeating. Also, I've seen some development. Um, so with refer policy, you can specify a policy that's applied to all the links clicked and all the resources, uh, connections gener generated by a page, like all the external CSS or JS, whatever. And with this uh, policy, no referrer is the strictest one. It kills referrers completely. Uh, so with this one single line, you can make a um, tangible improvement and stop leaking information today, right this minute even. Uh, it's still a draft, but it's supported by the major browsers. So check it out. The last thing that we checked for was inadvertent data leakage to uh, advertisers, content delivery networks, font hosting providers, and so forth. And the reason that we checked for this is that, so first of all, you have to remember that the visitors' legal protections, when you send off their data to the advertising industry, is really much worse than if you send off their data to an internet service provider. In the European Union, when the telecommunications markets were demonopolized in the 1990s, the legislators were very quick with enacting strong privacy regulations for users. So telecommunications providers are normally not allowed to sell data to anyone. They have to inform the user quite clearly about what information they can access, and they're also not allowed to process it for means beyond billing inside of their own business activities. This is not the case for an advertiser or a content delivery network. Whatever they find out about visitors to your site, they are allowed to sell to companies all over the world, hand over to the public authorities with much fewer safeguards. And even though the legal protection of visitors is, is very weak, we have this uh, massive spread of these technologies. Um, but we can, of course, again say, luckily, there are some simple solutions that you can implement on your sites that enable you to have the analysis that you need, while at the same time, your visitors don't have to reveal themselves to anyone that wants to influence their political opinions, market beliefs, uh, their families' opinions, and, and so forth. Uh, I will leave over to Anders to explain some of the challenges that the community is facing, but also what we can cheaply do and quickly to protect our visitors against this. So we have this situation today where if we don't want to be tracked by dozens of entities that are known to us when we visit many web pages. We have to use a multitude of the browser plugins to defend from the site we visit, which seems this is, it doesn't have to be this way. You can use you can have a functional website without exposing your visitors' information to lots of other people. Um, some things like using CDNs for jQuery or whatever, or Google Fonts, the privacy leak can be mitigated by using the aforementioned referral policy. Uh, in other cases, like with Google Analytics, you can use PeeWeek, which is awesome and self-hosted. 
and much like Google Analytics, but a lot more privacy friendly. Um, same with like, share, Twitter buttons from, well, with, with the vendor provided code, they also, always also leak data. And you can sell false icons yourself, for example. We don't actually have time to go into detail of all these. Uh, but we did compile a small list. You can see datahid.net slash WCEU2016 to check out some of these alternatives. Um, one thing that people should know more about is content security policy. It's a very powerful tool. It's basically an HTTP header that uh, well, the server sends to the browser, telling the browser to act in a certain way. By default, it, uh, <coughs> it blocks inline CSS and inline JavaScript. And you can use it to whitelist approved content sources. So with this tool, it says uh, <coughs> self is the, well, the same domain that you the page is on. So it says you, <coughs> it can load uh, things only for the same domain and also from uh, other domain.com for scripts. So you can, for example, tell the browser that the page is only allowed to load scripts from this and this website, or only images from this site, or only images and CSS, but no JavaScript at all. This is great for, well, security, prevent, preventing cross-site scripting. And it can also be used to prevent accidental information leakage. Uh, there's a great site called report-uri.io, where you can build these rules and check them. So, Check it out, it's a really cool tool. And again, if, even if you don't care about privacy, you might care about security. And what's good for privacy often good for security and vice versa. So yeah, check it out. So going forward, we're looking at more easy ways to visualize website privacy analysis results. Uh, what we found out with the grading of the um, municipalities in Sweden is that even though our grading system is done and we have the methodology for it, it's not always easy for people to conceptualize how data is being spread between different parties online. So uh, this is something that we'll be working with, we hope, in the upcoming year. We're also looking, if people are interested in making similar mappings of the public sector in other European Union countries. Because the thing about the public sector is, you should not be required to have five plugins in your browser only to have your government not tell the advertising industry uh, what kind of political information you're looking for. Uh, we hope that this talk has been inspirational and that you feel like joining us and also reviewing your own websites. Don't uh, forget to go to our tool and check your website out. We've also compiled in both English and Swedish information about all of these uh, tips that we provide and how you can easily implement them for, for yourself. Um, if you have any further questions, you're very welcome to come to the happiness bar after the talk uh, and we'll be there and answer uh, technical questions um, or any other questions that you can think of that are related to the field. All of the slides are available at datakyd.net uh, 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 slash WCEU2016. And of course, should you feel like it, you may also drop us emails. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a great next next of the World Camp Europe Conference.